Beautiful. I was supposed to sing too. In half an hour, uh, Andrea came early. And I think you just arrived and I changed my first song for this. So it was a last minute choice. I had a choice already. It was a milder, but I wanted something a little bit more upbeat and I just got caught by it. Indeed, it's quite something. So I'm glad about that. Thank you so much for singing. Uh, the, tonight, the message will be what it is. So I would like to ask you to turn in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 2 to 16. Okay, the message will be slightly longer than usual. So cope with me, but I know that the time will go fast. Okay. You know, maybe for Tony only, that we have been doing series of messages more than a year now on the universal church and the local church. And tonight, this is the last message that I have to say on the local church. It's over. I have nothing else to say because we have said a lot, lots of messages, which you can basically re-listen re online if you want to. They are all posted online. We have been looking, except for last week, I did a message on Remembrance Day. It was so-so. I was nervous and tired. Technical problem again. Uh, but apart from that, we have been doing lots of messages on the, on the local church. And tonight, we come to the last principle regarding the role of the women in the local church here. That is the head covering. We covered the principle of subjection which is the basis for all the other principles concerning the role of a woman in the local church. We have been teach, uh, talking about the issue of silence, and we have been talking also on to the issue of teaching women and so on and so forth, but the role of the woman in the local church here. It was supposed to be two messages, but I don't have enough, and I don't want to stretch it I want to keep it straight to the point. My only disappointment to my, tonight is to see so few people to listen to a message like this um, that should be listened to actually outside of any kind of boundaries of denomination. It's a message that is largely avoided. I never heard a message in a church myself on it properly expounded this way. But I have not been a churchgoer for a long time because I came to faith at the age of uh, uh, 33. So I've been in different churches, but needless to tell you that this is completely avoided. It has been declared an issue of culture and the majority of the people in our churches today, the majority of the women do not wear the head covering. So I'm outside of my comfort zone a little bit, but calm in my soul. So I will do a complete exposition of 1 Corinthians here chapter 11, verses 2 to 16, and make sure that you have this. This will help you a little bit, okay? See, Olga, if you don't have that piece of half paper to basically direct an outline and help me out here. Pardon me? Uh, yes, yes, it is. Okay, so let's concentrate. God bless you. Open your heart. Be calm and everything. There is nothing that will be said that doesn't make sense. Basically, it's one of the simplest passage to approach in the scriptures. There is nothing foggy in it. It is quite simple. So may the Lord bless you. Father, thank you for the privilege that I have right now to do it on YouTube and to do, do it in presence of the people of this local church that I love a lot. So be blessed, Lord, and bless me in Jesus' name. Amen. A, verse 2, that's what we call the God-given tradition. Okay, I'm not going to read the whole passage, and we're going to read it all, but not in one shot. We start the exposition right now. Now, I praise you because you remember me. It's Paul speaking in every, and uh, you remember me in everything and hold firmly to the tradition, circle traditions, just as I delivered them unto you. Okay. Remember that to the church of the Corinthians here, Paul was asking, was answering questions that they had and he wanted to put things in order also because they were quite having the reputation to be carnal here. In verse 2, we see the necessity of holding to the given tradition in the, church, uh, in the churches, which is also be given by oral tradition, the commands of Paul and so on. So Paul deals with the issue with seriousness, because to that principle, he will give it 16, uh, f 14 verses if you want to. 
So for Paul, the issue of the head covering in the church is not something trivial, trivial, but this is something that needs to be taken seriously and with great significance. Basically, you say this, there is a wrong way and a right way of worshiping God in the, Lord, in the local church. There is no middle, no middle ground. You have a, a right way to do it, and you have basically a wrong way to do it. And it's not a matter here of national custom, okay, at all. We will see that Paul nowhere will allude to any kind of custom or a matter of taste. It's a matter of Christian practice that must be confirmed to Christian doctrines and the teaching of the apostles and so on. So that's the duty of all local churches of all time, including Corinth, to be faithful to what we call the apostolic teaching and also apostolic authority. So that's what I have to say about verse 2 here, the principle of tradition and so on. Let's move on to capital B, the principle of headship. Come with me. But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of a woman, and God is the head of Christ here. That's the chain of command. That's the chain of command from, from Paul, including three links. The Father, God the Father, has headship over the Son. That's why the Son has taken humanity. humanity. When, we came, when He came here, the Father had headship over the Son. The Son has headship over me personally and over man in general. Over man in general. The Son has headship over man here. And the man has headship over woman here. Let me give you some ramification for the message tonight here. Subjection, like I explained to you, does not mean inferiority at all. And headship does not mean superiority, okay, at all. The Trinity are co-equal in Christ as the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in bodily form in the Messiah. Same with man and woman here. One co-equal becoming in subjection to another co-equal. So it's never an issue of superiority nor inferiority. The example of Christ when he subject himself unto Joseph and Mary until the age of 20-some here, he stayed home, he placed himself in subjection to them here, and he was a superior being, placing himself under subjection of two sinful beings. He did that because this is the divine command here. And that's what we call, I need your attention, a functional relationship. It's ordained by God. Sometimes you look at the world system, and it's a world system that is in chaotic disorder. And that world system out there that we have that is in chaotic disorder has crept in into the churches today because we have kept the people in ignorance by not teaching these things here. Okay? God asks an order of worship. There is a divine command and divine order for humanity. The word man here in verse 3 has the definite article in the Greek, the man. Woman does not have that art definite article in the original. Why do I, do I say this? That is significant since it shows, since it does show a functional relationship. Subordination of femaleness to maleness, that's the functional way. That's the divine way here. So in verse 3, we find one of the theological, make a note of that, theological truths upon which the practice of the head covering will now be elaborated. It's theological. It has nothing to do with culture or pressure and so on and so forth from society or different countries and so on. So now we cannot acculturate the practice because it's based on theological facts. Right? Okay? C, the, the application of the doctrine, verses 4, 5, and 6. I read everything to 4 to 6. Stay with me. Every man who has something on his head while praying or prophesying disgraces his head. 
But every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head, for she is one and the same as the woman whose head is shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, let her also have her hair cut off. But if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, let her cover her head. Let me elaborate on that. Let's begin in verse 4 with the man here. Every man who has something on his head while praying or prophesying, or prophesying disgraces his head here. The application goes first to the man here. Okay? His head is to remain uncovered. To cover his head here in the church meeting here would be a disgrace to his own head. And I'm pretty sure that you would be in total discomfort if every Thursday night I will preach with a bald cap. You will not like it. Be honest with me. You would say it's completely improper. He does a long prayer, the pastoral prayer, with his head covered. Think about it for a moment. No condemnation. Would you accept me every Thursday night with a bald cap? You would not. You would not. Okay, it would also dishonor Christ as his head. If I would wear something on my head here, I would dishonor Christ as being my head. So that's why when somebody plants a messianic congregation, I struggle with it. Even in Israel and in New York, they, they, they plant messianic congregation that believes on Christ. But the only thing that is improper, it's when the man goes to church with the kippah. They can't do it. They need to be uncovered. So you start a messianic congregation. They want to identify as Jews. I went to the synagogue a few, a few months ago, a year ago now when I went to Israel. But it was not a church meeting for me. Because when you go to the synagogue, they ask you to wear a kippah. But they carry on within the messianic congregation. And it's improper concerning to the passage that we examine right now. That's what I have to say about the man. Let's come to the woman, 5 and 6. Small a, the command, verse 5. But every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head, for she is one and the same as the woman whose head is shaved. Let's, uh, let's read 6 again. For if a woman does not cover her head, let her also have her hair cut off. But, it, but if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, let her cover her her head. Now he, he applies it to the woman, and the word woman here has to, be, uh, has to be taken in a sense in general. It may mean, you have space to play here, it may mean a wife or a married woman. This is ejectically correct. This is an option that we have, okay? First, if you want to take it this way, it may mean a woman in general or a married woman here. Either or, it's okay. So some people say, because of the principle of subjection, that the passage apply only for those who are married. This is a proper way to say it. But you can go the other way as well, saying that it does apply here for all the women. I like both. But to be honest with you, because the principle of subjection I tend to lean towards the exposition that it's for married women. However, I like both because my little girl will be brought up this way. Although she will not be married, they need to learn in low age what it is to be in subjection to a husband. And because we have failed to train our children with generation and generation this way, that's why the ladies are usurping the role in the marriage, and that's why so many Christian marriages do suffer in the same way. So I believe, based upon the experience that I have, based upon what I did witness in time, and even with you tonight, the older we get, the harder we are to be taught. I need to be with love here. The older we get, the harder it is to uproot thinking that we have ingrained in our mind here and the way that we have been brought up with this. So here, with all my love, what is important because it's a church plant and sometimes I'm wondering if we will be able to carry on, 
my desire, personal desire, was to start the proper way. Not the Baptist way, not the Pentecostal way, not the Anglican way, but the proper way from the Bible we need to establish together our doctrine without imposing, but to go from there that you may know from me where do I stand on these things. Simply not to lose credibility with you. Why would I take Isaiah chapter 6 and 7 about the virgin birth literally and here twist and tell you that this is a culture issue and a social issue? I would ask you not to believe on my teaching anymore. Let's be unshakable. A child can understand these passages, these passages, these passages here. So minimally, it refers to a married woman, perhaps to unmarried as well. Verse 5, the command on your outlines. The command, verse 5. But to every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying, this grace is her head, for she's one and the same as the woman whose head is shaved here. The word uncovered here in the Greek is an article of clothing. Don't think that this is your hair, lady. Your hair, hair is not your head covering. Here in the Greek, the word uncovered, it's to put the jacket on, it's an article of clothing, and to take it off. It's to, pick, to put a, a head covering of made of cloth, to put it on, and to take it off. That's the word for covering in, here, in that place. You put it on, you put it off. So a woman, in contrast to the men, should have her head covered in the meeting of the church. Now in verses 4 and 5, let's look at the issue of praying and prophesying because that's where the gymnastics, the exegetical gymnastic is gone here. In 1 Corinthians, these are two terms used to encompass what's going on in the church meeting. It's, from, it's an idiom from A to Z. You pray, you do a pastoral prayer. If there is at that time somebody with the gift of prophecy and everything in between, the gift, basically the praying and prophesying, these two terms are used to a sum total of what is happening in the church service here. I don't believe that the gift of prophecy is given anymore, but here we have the gift, of, we have the teaching happening here and a predication in a sermon here. I have prayed, and I will close with the benediction here. Somebody can stand up, a man here with the gift of wisdom, give a gift, give a word of exhortation, and so forth. As far as speaking is concerned, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 15, 14 and 15 deals with this. As far as prophesying is mentioned, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 3, 4, 5, 22, 24, and 31 deals with that. So simply remember, it's an idiomatic term describing what's going on in the church service at large. Praying is general. It's available to all. Because while I was praying, you, you ladies were praying with me. In your heart, in silent, very much aloud. So praying is available to all. Prophesying is limited to those with the gift as well as teaching a pastoral teacher, it's limited to those with the gift. Both praying and prophesying in the church is limited to men. We know that from 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. And 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 10, 11. So praying and prophesying, it's given to men simply because we have studied that in the church, the women have to remain silent. Okay? Prophesying is limited to men also, based upon 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 33 to 34. At this point here, Paul is dealing with the head covering. In chapter 14, he will deal with speaking, but we have been there. It's tick mark for us. This is the last principle that we take here. So Tony gave an example that she leads a group for men. I don't know if she teaches, I'll ask at the end. She probably teaches the word or verse and so on. That can be done this way, not to man. And I know you understand these things. The verse 5, when you have a heavy word here, disgrace, disgraces. There is two aspects for this, or disgrace or dishonoring. So she dishonored her own head. When the, the head uncovered, she dishonored her own head 
And he also disgraced the figurative head, the man. So a woman that is uncovered in the church disgraces her own head, and she disgraces the figure head, the figurative head, the man. Furthermore, a woman uncovered is to be identified with those who are shaved here. Although she may not be shaved, she needs to be seen as those who are saved. And in ancient time here, shaved three groups here. Adulterous wife needed to be shaved, unwed mother, and the priestess of the phallic cult. Google it if you want to know phallic cult, okay? Okay, identify with that kind of cult. Now we come to verse 6, the analogy. If a woman does not cover her head, let her also have her hair cut off. We can stare, stop right there for a moment. In the Greek, that sentence, it's a first-class condition assumed to be true. That's what we call a first-class condition in Greek, which assumed the statement to be true. If one is going to, the, the, to the disregard the covering, if one lady, one woman, is going to disregard the covering imposed by headship, then she may as well also throw off that which is imposed by nature, her hair. Be, why? One, if one is going to disregard the covering imposed by headship, the theological aspect of it, she may as well also throw, which is imposed, throw away, which is imposed by nature, her hair. Shave them. To that point because your hair covering is not your hair so if you disregard the headship aspect may as well disregard which is given to you by nature and I will come back to this it is here that we see the distinction between the hair and the head covering they are not one and the same because that's the it, that's the outside door to the people oh you don't need to wear it anymore because your hair serve as your head covering false because the two words are different. The word article of clothing, a cloth here, is something that you put on and put, up, put out here, not your natural hair. 6b, okay, 6b. But if it is a disgraceful for a woman to have her head cut off or her head shaved, let her cover her head. So if she's going to disregard the head covering, which is related to theology by a chip here, then let her also go ahead and shave the covering imposed by nature. I just repeat it. So if it is disgraceful for her to shave her head, which it is, it would be a disgrace because you love your hair, ladies. And you would not be, able to, you would not be willing to shave here. So may as well let her cover her head here. Now we come... Now we come to the defense of the doctrine, 7 to 15, the defense of the doctrine. Evidence from creation, come with me, 7 to 12. For a man ought not to have his head covered, since he is the image and the glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. For man does not origin from woman, but woman from man. For indeed, man was not created for the woman's sake, but the woman for the man's sake. In verse 10, therefore the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head. We stop right at this place here uh, for, the, for, the, for the time being. Evidence from creation. Okay? Can we allegorize creation? Some churches did. There is a church in Victoria, a church packed with young people in Victoria that teaches that the creation is just an allegory of things. So how can you take and deliver a message like this which is based upon creation in the Bible? They don't hold the proper view of Genesis. They say that it's all allegorical. So if it's all allegorical, I cannot teach that right now in that church. I will be kicked out. But I, will, I would teach it anyway despite of the fact that it would be kicked out. But anyway, I will not be invited there anyway. Okay? From creation here. It's a reflection of the glory. Listen to that closely. Man. 
reflects God's glory and the image of God's glory. That's what I reflect right now, and that's what you reflect, what you reflect, what you reflect, you and you also. We reflect God's image and glory. We're not God. But that's why we are asked not to cover, because we reflect God's glory. Man, man is similar to God in that he has headship and authority, and his uncovered head give and his uncovered head gives the visible. We have authority to do what we do. You can come and pray, all of you. You can come and stand up and give a word of exhortation. Stand up your voice and read some and say, Beloved, I would like you to apply this and so on. That's the role of man in the church here. So man or ma man is similar to God in that he has headship. Headship where over God? No, you know already. Headship over the wife and his uncovered head gives the visible manifestation of this. That's why you would not allow me to have a bald cap right now. So our head uncovered shows our, our basically the principle of proper subordination with God. What's the invisible truth? What is cannot seen is that he is the head of the woman. When you get into your car as a couple of Christians and you go back home or you cross the Malahat or you go to Comox on a summer day in a convertible, people, they see you as a couple in the car. It does not show outside the local church that there is a principle of subordination there. But here, that's the invisible. And the visible is the uncovered head as well as the covered head for the wife in the meeting. It's the visible sign of it. Speaking on my wife right now, when I go home later, when the meeting of the church will be dismissed, I'm allowed to pick on her right now because of the situation. She takes it off. The meeting of the church is over. So there is an invisible manifestation. Nobody knows in the apartment building that I am the head of the house and she is, I, I am the, Christ is the head of me and I have the head of my wife and so on. It's not seen. But when we come to give a proper worship here, it becomes a visible sign in both ways. It becomes a visible sign in both ways. She shows that she's in subjection to me, and I am showing, having nothing here, that I am in subjection to him. A child, Sophia, would understand these things here. On the other hand, the woman reflects the glory of the man. On the other hand, the woman reflects the glory of the man. She reflects man's subordination to God by her own subordination. She's helping me right now. Get me. I wish that the place would be full. She's helping me right now. By doing this, she says, Francois, remember, you're the glory of Christ. And I am your glory. So the glory of the man, she reflects man's subordination to God by her own subordination. So it's a win-win situation. That's why, beloved, be with me. When I start the meeting, it's going to take an hour. It doesn't matter. We're not, we're not going to sing. I'm almost done anyway. What do I say all the time repeatedly? 52 Thursdays. Silent time. Father, thank you for being here in your presence. Be pleased with what we do. Why do you think that I do that prayer? Because of the four principles that we have studied. Because the angels are reporting, I'm going to get dead in a moment here, I'm jumping the gun here. Because the angels are reporting, can you imagine that? Should be on our face and knees all together. Duncan, British Columbia, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 people. There is an angel in that room or more, I don't want to know how many. And we're not asked to talk to them. And he goes fast. And he is reporting right now to God, the Almighty God in heaven, behind the stars, what's being said and done here. He doesn't need to go to YouTube. They don't have the internet in the third heaven. He is the internet. And he knows everything, and he reports. Do you know that? Do you know what, Father? Uh, just, just to be joke. no, I don't know what. Francois Blouin is speaking on the head covering right now. Oh, really? Didn't know that. Of course it's false, because he knew it. What's being said? <laughs> oh, really? Huh. I wish that we would take it, these things seriously as I do. By covering her head, she does not detract and does not 
compete with men's glory. It's not a hockey game here. By covering the head, she's not competing with me at all. She's not competing with my glory, taking the proper place. Verse 8. Where is verse 8? He does deal with the order of creation. More evidence here that Paul gives here. I'm in verse 8 right now. What's verse 8? For a man does not originate from woman, but woman from man here. He goes with more evidence based upon the creation. Not now. Not now. Creation. Paul points out that the man's origin in creation was independent of the woman. Being created from the dust of the ground, man here, but the woman came from the side here. So without Adam's prior existence, she could not have come into being. Without Adam's in creation, comma, quotation mark, bolded in creation. In creation, because woman is taken from the side in creation, if Adam is not created, men would not have come into being. So the creation here of Adam was independent for, for the woman here. But the woman's origin, origin was dependent on the man created out of his side. Without Adam, no existence for the woman. Furthermore, the purpose of man's creation was not to be the helper suitable for her. It's the opposite that is the truth. He take woman from the side to be a helper meet or suitable for the man. So in light of the order of creation here and the purpose of woman's creation, for this reason he draws the conclusion in verse 10, the word therefore. That's why you have therefore the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the theological truth taught previously in the previous passages he uses creation which we cannot allegorize and he uses headship which we cannot allegorize it's only theological there is nothing 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 about culture here he did not give a single ex example of crea of a creation of um, culture only theological reason and because of it he says the woman ought to have her head here covered okay Are you excited? Goosebumps? Probably not. I'm not there. Okay? So the head covering functions as a visible sign of a theological truth. Okay? Same for the man uncovered. It's the visible sign here that we witness of a theological truth. Then he gives the other, uh, the other reason because of angels. Are you willing to acculturate the angels? To acculturate them? No. Angels, they have a role, very briefly on them. They have a role of observation. In Luke 15, 10, they observe when somebody comes to faith. Luke, read Luke 15, 10. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, they, when you cry, when you struggle at work, brother, they look at you. And they report to God. They observe. He's crying. He's having a bad day. He's bullied by the guy. Francois is discouraged. They are in the room there, somewhere, and they observe. And they wonder, wow. They wonder probably how it is like to be a being and stuff like that. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10, they learn God's wisdom to the church, or what's left of it. Or what's left of it. Like some churches in the valley, they are just a gong show. Okay? First Timothy chapter 5, verse 21. They learn also, they look if the commands are obeyed. The point here is that the angel are observing if God's commands are being obeyed in the church. Think Revelation chapter 2 and 3. To the angel of the church of so and so, and the angels are not pastor. There is an angel or angel spur, and they report to God what's being go go going on here. Let me recap. Three theological truths. Reflection of proper headship. It's been addressed that Christ is my head. Father, the Father's head of Christ. Christ is the head of Francois. 
and uh, François is the head of the wife. The order of creation itself, what I just mentioned after headship, and the observation of angels here. 11 and 12, we talk about interdependence here. We're still on the evidence of creation. 11 and 12, come with me. However, in the Lord, neither is woman independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. Oh, contradiction? No, we'll see that. For as the woman originates from the man, so also the man has his birth through the woman, and all things originate from God here. There is an issue of interdependence here. Paul here, the fact that he's, despite the fact that he is not married, protects the woman from any kind of being de, uh, to be demeaned and being put down and taken advantage of because of headship here. Uh, the man here, I do not have the right to be arrogant with Olga because of the headship principle. While it is true that in creation, while it is true that in creation the woman was not independent, uh, was not independent of the man, but man was independent of the woman, yet in time, in time now, since creation now, the man is not independent of the woman because I came from my mom. So I'm not independent of the woman. It was good only in creation. The only exception is Adam here. All men came by means of woman. With one exception, Adam, created from the Adamah. Think about it. Think about it. How beautiful is the creation. Adam, he created out of the Adama, breathed into his nostril, and he came a living being, physically being living, and also sustaining a spiritual relationship with God. Breathed his breath in the nocturne and he became a full grown. The penis was there. All the organs of reproduction was fully grown. He never grew no belly button. And he named the animal and nothing was suitable for him. Sex wise and companionship wise. Moo. Bleh. He named them but it was not really suitable to put your arm around the cow and say I love you honey. And then she was created of the side. It's, I'm going to create a helper suitable for her, and so on and so forth. So in, in creation, there is that principle that God gave for mankind to follow so that God might be pleased in the world and that the abuse against the lady may stop. But we don't teach that. We teach equality. And women now are usurping roles here. And it puts a tremendous pressure on a female child, a young lady, that they need to know everything and do everything and so on, and the world, is, the world is collapsing right now. You have the same abuse within the Christian realm than you have passed the door here. Because we have failed the people to teach the scriptures properly and honestly. And it's not with messages like this that I will pack that place. You will have empty chairs here for the next 25 years with messages like this. I'm not going to do it once a year, and I'm getting carried away. I love it. If only the teachers and the expositors would stop their stupidity of allegorizing everything, we would go somewhere in the text. How can these church be packed where they're not telling the truth to the people? They're just a bunch of people pleasers. Get out of there. There is interdependence here. The woman must respect. The man must respect womanhood. You will say, yes, but he's got remarried. Yes, I got remarried. But that doesn't kill the fact that I love women for a theological perspective. A high regard for womanhood. Childbearing. And so on. It's important. We need to be loved the proper way. But women don't know anymore how to be loved. They want diamond ring. Where they had covering. It's way cheaper. <laughs> so when the church at large surrendered under the pressure of society and culture and gave up that type of teaching that we teach right now, from Paul they became guilty of stopping the teaching of the fundamentals of loving women in the pure Christian way ordained by God. This is a quote of me. The evidence from nature, 1315. Not 13, 13 and 15. Come. Judge for yourself. Uh, am I talking to you? No, I'm reading the text right now. 
Judge for yourself if it is proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered. Don't even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him? Do you watch baseball? Yes. I do. And it's so ugly when you see a pitcher with the hair there coming out of the hat. It, it, right of the way you have a reaction to it. I'm reading this right now. Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is for glory to her, for her hair is given to her for covering. But if one is inclined, I'm not going to go to one is inclined right now. In verse 13, he asks the question of the, from the standpoint of propriety. What is proper? That's from this standpoint that Paul is asking the question. What is suitable? They are to judge not from personal opinions. Don't be offended. What you think about the passage here, I'm not concerned about it. What I'm concerned about, dear beloved, is what God says about the passage. Okay? We're not in Bible school here where they say, how does this passage speak to you? It's not how does this passage speak to you. And see, it's how this passage speaks to the audience written to by the author of the book. It's not how what I think, Francois, of the passage here. It would be way simpler and way more efficient in the donation box, perhaps, to completely avoid that. Start a church and don't teach that stuff. No, this is not the style of men that you have in front of you. It's not me. Not because of culture, but from the divine norm. And what's the divine norm? You know that. It's, from be it's, it's between verses 2 and 12. It's there. That's the divine norm. From the standpoint of priori pri pri propriety, the woman should have her head cover. If she wants to conform to the biblical norm, that's what she needs to do. How would you react if I would constantly speak, that's in my note with a ball cap on my head, or a toque? I will do it. I will wear a toque when I will teach the Pentateuch. In verses 14 and 15, we also have an evidence from the standpoint of long hair. Now, the issue of long hair here come, comes in. He develops the glory aspect mentioned earlier, earlier. He develops the glory that he spoke a few verses ago. In verse 14, it says like this here, does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him. But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her for her hair is given to her for a covering here. Okay? He starts with the man's nature. Okay? And the woman's hair is longer than a man universally. I don't know if you have traveled. You do have traveled. You have traveled to Israel and perhaps in different countries. You have traveled in your life too. It doesn't matter where you go. With a few exception, all the time Germany confirmed that with me. You are men that travel too. The ladies have longer hair than the men. Go to Israel. If you want to see beautiful hair on the street, for those who don't, most of the Orthodox Jewish ladies, they cover their hair, but ask them to undo it, and it might go there, curly to the, uh, close to the, 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 the spine and so on, and uh, whew, looks great. Okay? So there should be an objective difference between the man and the woman in the length of the hair. It does not give a cubit or whatnot. But there should be an objective difference here, and it is. Around the world, you have it. If man has long hair, it dishonor because by growing his hair, he is usurping the glory of the woman. If I let them go like some guys here, it looks beautiful on me too. So I usurp the glory that should go to her. Here. Beside teaching the necessity of the head covering, Paul goes on to carry further the necessity of the woman here being longer than a man in verse 15. He does not give a specific length, but that's the teaching. On the other hand, on verse 15, her, her long hair is her glory. Ladies, your long hair is your glory. It is an adornment. It is the basis for glamour and beauty, and it does enhance femininity. Men, be honest with me. When you see, go to Walmart or whatever the place, and you can see sometimes red hair, and they have it there, and so on, or black, or blonde, and wow, that's a nice head of hair here. And that's given to ladies as an adornment, a natural adornment. 
for their glamour. They like it. And it's beautiful. Let's be honest, guys. It's beautiful. But in the church, it has to be covered. Her long hair is given to her for a covering, a permanent covering. Okay? That's where people try to dismiss the passage. They say that the hair of a lady is the covering. So if the hair of the lady is the covering here, it means that I, can, I need to shave every time that I go to church. Because a human being here with hair too. So if my hair is my covering and I'm asked not to cover my hair, so my head, so I need to shave myself, it doesn't make sense. It's not sustainable. The Greek word for covering here is different than the one used in verse 6. That's a permanent covering, a, na a natural endow endowment. Here it conveys a more permanent covering. It is her, it is her glory. And because her hair is her glory, if she comes to the church meeting uncovered, she would naturally deflect and tame, take from the glory of men showed as his unveiled hair. Head. How many distract? Don't, don't speak, I'm just going to give you an example. I'm sitting right here and I have a bunch of young people and older ladies right in front of me right now. And there is a group of three girls there, long hair. I, I'm not going to give you type because I don't want to get in trouble. Beautiful long hair uncovered. And if the pastor is boring, where, what do you think I will be looking at? You th I will concentrate on the song you do like this. But when everybody's sitting down, you're not watching my eyes to what I look. But if I see this, you, pay, you, uh, you don't pay close much attention. It deters. Even something smaller than this. You don't need to cover the full length. But if I see an article of clothing on the hair here, my eyes will catch this right away. Here, you don't notice anything different, but if I do that, if I cut this one, what you will notice first is missing one. So by this way, for a moment to have the head cover, it does not detract the worship. Everything stays at the proper place. It's way more fun to look at my wife 